you are welcome to today's video and it's a good news one women that are pregnant are not reporting symptoms of COVID-19 more than women that are not pregnant so it looks like from the data in the UK and from Sweden pregnant women are not getting infected with COVID-19 more than none pregnant women so that is good news and the second point of this video there's a few points but the main second point is that women that do have COVID-19 that are pregnant are being hospitalized at the same rate as women who have COVID-19 who are not pregnant so women that are pregnant aren't getting more symptomatic COVID-19 women that are pregnant are not being hospitalized more than other women so pretty good news really. Now the background to this is there's been a concern for this for a long time. There was some data I looked at way back in February from Hong Kong relating to SARS coronavirus 1 from 2003. And that did show that women did seem to be disproportionately affected. So this is something I've been worried about for a long time. I haven't mentioned it because I didn't want to be alarmist. Um, I didn't mention it since February because I don't want to be alarmist about it. But now it's possible to give the good news. So um, that's what this video is about. If you want to skip it, fine, be boring. But if you want to stick around for the information and the detail, then it's always worth having, I think. Now, the background to this, the National Health Service. Pregnant women have been included in the list of people at moderate risk, clinically vulnerable as a precaution. So that's the position of the, the UK Health Service. And the rationale for this is good because during pregnancy, the immune system is not as efficient as it normally is because if the immune system was working at full full capacity during pregnancy, there's a risk that the mother would recognise the baby, the unborn baby, the fetus, as foreign material and therefore cause miscarriage. And we know that women, for example, who are pregnant are more prone to influenza. Um, so it wouldn't be surprising if they were more prone to COVID-19. So the, the NHS correctly took that precaution. Uh, this is from their website today about an hour before I did this video and, and that's still their advice so we have to go by this advice and we have to follow that because that's the current NHS advice. Centres for Disease Control and um, pregnant people might be at increased risk for severe COVID-19 compared to non-pregnant people. That was their thinking. This new data would indicate that this is not correct but this is from the CDC website this morning so we still have to go with it that this new information hasn't really filtered through to the official websites yet. Maybe increased risk for other adverse outcomes such as preterm birth. Well, again, we're not finding evidence for that, but that's still what the CDC are saying. So let's look at where this new evidence is coming from. And as you might suspect, it's coming from the COVID Symptom Tracker app. Um, healthy pregnant women do not fall more seriously ill from COVID-19 than non-pregnant women. So very good news. Pregnant women do not differ in how severely they are likely to fall ill with COVID-19. The hospitalisation rates are the same for pregnant women and non-pregnant women who happen to be infected with COVID-19. Now, there was question marks over this in the past because quite a lot of the early data came from patients that were hospitalised. And of course, the patients that are hospitalised aren't necessarily a representative sample. And the good thing about the COVID Symptom Tracker app is it's community-based. And it's based on very large numbers, as we'll see. So um, this is community-based, so that's good. And uh, it's based on information from two groups of pregnant women. So let's look at those now. Where am I? There I am. Right. Now, group one, where the data came from, group one, 4 million UK users and 50,000 Swedish users of the app. Uh, that's where the first data set came from, so that's pretty good. Group two, uh, 1.9 million women aged 18 to 44 who responded to the US-based Facebook COVID symptom study. Links on there. This is based by the, organised by the Carnegie Mellon Delphi Research Centre. So, um, Pretty large numbers, so 1.9 million women in the States responded to that. Now, this was a Facebook-based uh, data collecting system. And I'm going to report later, maybe on this video or the next one, I'm not sure, um, 
that the COVID symptom tracker app is now expanded to the United States. So full details on that to come. And of course, we will be encouraging to do that, people to, to do that. But st sticking with the pregnancy uh, issue, uh, group one from the UK and Sweden. Self-reporting health data from 14,000 pregnant women. So 14,000 pregnant women reported here, of whom 629 were likely to have COVID-based, uh, COVID, uh, coronavirus um, COVID-19 COVID infection, SARS coronavirus 2 infection based on their symptoms. So this app is getting pretty good at recognizing people that are positive now uh, from the symptoms and they estimated that of the 14,000 women, 629 were probably uh, infected due to their symptoms. Now of this uh, 629, who were, did have COVID-19 during their pregnancy, 21 were hospitalized. Now, this compared to a comparable group uh, with, with the data from 387,000 non-pregnant female app users. So what essentially we've got here is two groups. The first group is the pregnant group with 14,000 pregnant women in it. The second group is 387,000 with uh, women that weren't pregnant. So really, this is the experimental group here. And it means we have this huge control group to compare them against. Now of the 387,000, 25,000 were suspected to have COVID and 600 ended up in hospital. Now I've done a bit of a back of an envelope calculation here. See if this makes sense. So symptomatically, so um, 629 women had symptoms of COVID-19 out of 14,000 that were pregnant. That means that 4.49 of pregnant women reported symptomatic COVID-19. Of those that weren't pregnant, 25,000 women reported symptoms out of the 387,000. Turn that into a percentage and you get 6.46. So what we see is actually there are more symptomatic women in the non-pregnant group than they were in the pregnant group. Now, of course, pregnant women have probably been taking more precautions. So we can't say from this that non-pregnant women get more COVID-19 than pregnant women. It's because they, the non-pregnant women were probably exposed more. But this data is showing quite clearly that pregnant women are not reporting higher incidence of symptomatic COVID-19 compared to non-pregnant women. Let's just look at the percentages again. So in pregnancy, 4.49 reported symptomatic COVID-19. In women that weren't pregnant, 6.46 reported symptomatic COVID-19. So that is remarkably encouraging data based on those figures. Now, the second group, mostly US-based, 1.3 million survey responders, responses from women, very good, included 42,000 pregnant women, so a good sized sample. 2.9 of the pregnant respondents were suspected to have COVID-19 based on their symptoms, compared with 4% of non-pregnant women. So again, 2.9% of uh, the pregnant responders were suspected to have COVID-19, 4% of others were suspected to have COVID-19. But again, we would expect the women that are pregnant to be shielding at least to some degree. So these differences aren't surprising, but it is showing, this data is showing that women with who are pregnant do, do, not, do not get more COVID-19 symptomatic disease than people that are not pregnant. So 2.9% are pregnant, 4% of none pregnant. So this is very encouraging uh, information. Um, actually, I just I forgot to mention on group one, we could, we could look at the hospitalization rates as well. Um, so group one hospitalization rates, uh, 21 out of 14,000 were hospitalized. Um, so they're the hospitalizations, they're the number of pregnancies. That gives us 0.15% of pregnant women who were symptomatic for COVID-19 were hospitalized because of those symptoms. 0.15%. But when we look at the people that were uh, not pregnant,
Uh, where am I? When we look at the people that weren't pregnant, there was uh, 600 hospitalized out of 387,000. Turn that in percentage and we get 0.1. 5% of non-pregnant women were hospitalized. So we see the percentage of hospitalization in pregnant women, 0.15. We see the percentage of hospitalization in non-pregnant women, 0.15. Indicating that pregnant and non-pregnant women are just getting complications at the same rate. So the hospitalized women that were pregnant were getting COVID-19 at the same rate as their non-pregnant friends and sisters. Good. Now, a little more data to come from this. Um, also very useful stuff. Uh, symptoms for pregnant women, group one and two. Symptoms were similar to non-pregnant women or non-pregnant people. So the symptoms are much the same. Persistent cough, headache, loss of taste and smell, anosmia, chest pain, sore throat, fatigue, as we would expect. But there is a but. And this could be important. Increased incidence of gastrointestinal symptoms, nausea and vomiting in the group of pregnant women who later became ill. In other words, in the group of pregnant women that later required hospitalisation, these were the early features indicating or potentially indicating that their condition was deteriorating. So what we need is a high index of suspicion in women that are pregnant and have symptomatic COVID-19 for gastrointestinal symptoms, nausea and vomiting, because that may lead on to more serious illness. It's difficult because, of course, these are symptoms, particularly of early pregnancy. Uh, a lot of women got, get nausea, vomiting in the first trimester. Some women it goes on for both or three trimesters of pregnancy. So it's difficult, but we just have to have, have a higher index of suspicion. So if a woman is pregnant and has COVID-19 and has these symptoms, uh, a, a medical assessment would be advisable. So uh, tested women were test uh, pregnant women were tested more frequently for COVID-19, but no more likely to suffer symptomatic or severe disease, which is good, or <clears throat> be ill for longer than those who weren't pregnant. They were not ill for longer. The duration of the illness was not longer in pregnant women compared to non-pregnant women. But so far, everything we've talked about is in the absence of any underlying health problems. This is healthy women. What about women with comorbidities? Well, pregnant women with existing health conditions that we recognise, they were more likely to end up in hospital than pregnant women without comorbidities, as actually you would expect. But the rates of pregnant women with comorbidities being hospitalised were the same as the rates of non-pregnant women with comorbidities being hospitalised. So again, the rates were the same. So um, that is really quite, uh, quite encouraging information. Now, that's all very good and promising. Uh, and I was, was worried about this. Um, but now we know that healthy and women with comorbidities are both hospitalised at the same rate and that uh, pregnant women are not reporting more symptomatic um, COVID-19 infections, which is good. Right, so that, that's the end of this video really, but there's something that struck me. I've been thinking about this for some time now. You know, in this pandemic, in many ways, we've been very, very lucky very fortunate because it could have been that this new zoonotic viruses virus that spilled over from the animal kingdom into us was not as relatively benign as it is now i know this virus is bad enough it causes deaths and it's very transmissible but it could have been more transmissible it could have been much more deadly and it could it could have greatly adversely affected pregnant women and it could have greatly adversely affected the developing fetus as well because there's a long history of uh, viral infections that can cause german measles for example it's, it's well known that it can cause fetal uh, abnormalities 
And just to give one example of that, um, let's look, look, look briefly at the Zika virus. Um, now, the Zika virus, named after the Zika forest in somewhere in Africa, Congo, I can't quite remember. Anyway, it's a viral disease. It's spread by mosquitoes, but it's still a, it's still a zoonotic virus. It comes from monkeys. Uh, mild symptoms last for two to seven days. Most cases are asymptomatic. But if pregnant women get it, micro small brain. These children have tiny brains and tiny heads, and it's quite. Um, I'm not going to show you any any pictures. It's um, they're, all, they're all real human beings. But but Google it, and um, you'll be as upset as I am by the pictures. I'm sure. Uh, children with uh, small brains. Of course, the brain doesn't recover significantly just because the mother got a particular viral infection. Um, also, Zika virus um, preterm births, miscarriages, causes neurological complications. You know, Guillain Barry syndrome is a poly neuritis, it's an inflammation of many nerves that can cause paralysis and even stop you breathing. Uh, neuropathy. Uh, disease of the nerves and myelitis is damage or inflammation of the spinal cord. Now, I don't want to get too worried about this. Um, there's no current local transmission of Zika virus in the continental United States at the moment, um, or, or in the UK for that matter. Uh, but there is some cases in Brazil still and uh, other places in South America and some places in Africa. But the reason I bring that up is that... We've been lucky that this virus is not a teratogenic virus. It's not damaging, as far as we know, it's not damaging unborn babies and it's not damaging their, their pregnant mums. But there's nothing about the fundamental nature of spillover zoonotic infection that dictates that's the case. Next time, we might not be so lucky. Right, I've got some information from the US, but I think I'll let that video stand alone because it's so important. But I will just show you a few uh, pictures. Um, where are we? Yes. Now these dogs belong to um, Amber. In uh, I think she lives in Melbourne. Now the reason I put these dogs on is uh, Amber and her sister Tara have promised to send me a picture of them. So I am looking forward to that, ladies. But in the meantime, you'll recognise Ruby, Harry and Sally. So looking forward to your pictures. I'll take that one as a banker. Uh, this is Lennart from Stockholm. This is on his daily commute in the underground in Stockholm. So glad to see that uh, precautions are being taken. Let's hope everyone is, is as sensible as uh, Lennart is. Oh, this is Sam and Danny. Now, I think this is Sam. They've got this deep clean business, so they've been busy cleaning places out. <laughs> and that, I think that's Danny. Look like spacemen, don't they? <laughs> anyway, Sam and Danny, I expect a picture where I can see you uh, possibly watching one of my videos, although that's optional. Right. OK, we'll leave it there for today. Um, good news on pregnancy um, and, and shows the importance of the COVID symptom tracker app, which um, I don't think I'll do it now because I want that pregnancy video to stand alone, but we will come back and do one on the introduction of the COVID symptom tracker app into the United States. Thank you for watching as always.